I'm Scott Cook. I founded, co-founded a company called Intuit in Silicon Valley 30 years ago. And uh, today I'm the kind of executive chairman of the company. And we are here at the Inc. conference in Kochi, India. So you had earlier this day, you had a conversation with Lakshmi where you mentioned your kind of understanding of leadership. If you look back the last 30 years, how has this concept or your ideas of leadership, how have they changed or do have they changed at all? Yes, my thoughts on leadership have changed a bunch. Um, you know, I think we grew up with the leadership that, for example, my father learned in the military. Uh, hierarchical, top-down, think of uh, a major military invasion. And that was all of our view of leadership, that the boss makes the decision, tells everybody what to do. But somehow, as I looked at the performance of the company in today in this age of innovation, I was left with a gnawing feeling that that was no longer right or sufficient um, for a lot of reasons. It tended to alienate the youngest and many of the most creative people in the company. The ideas of some of the people who had the most important game-changing, out-of-the-box ideas, the ones you really need to spur new growth, those ideas didn't fare very well in the hierarchy. Uh, the old process of decisions by PowerPoint and persuasion and politics seemed to wind up with consensus decisions that were importantly boring and safe. When the innovations that produce real growth are often quite different than what the hierarchy wants. And most of all, I noticed that a bunch of decisions were well, just plain wrong. Decisions that our smartest people made with good analysis and lots of PowerPoint. Decisions I participated in. When you look back, they were wrong. So all this high-level approval and running decisions up the hierarchy with all this time and analysis didn't seem to guarantee success at all. If anything, the opposite was true. So I observations of some other companies and some very different sorts of things, I saw a pattern where if you could move the decision from politics and PowerPoint to running an experiment, a real experiment with real customers, with real data, and then make the decision based on the experiment, well, now you're making decisions based on proof. And now if you drive the cost of experiments down, you could allow anyone to run experiments, which means now the newest people in the company are, are no longer disenfranchised by the hierarchy. But how does this change the hierarchy if you have leadership by or decision yes, making by? That's right. So I call it decision by hierarchy. Excuse me. The old way was decision by hierarchy. This I call decision by experiment. And you remove the decisions from the hierarchy. The bosses don't vote. Instead, you let the experiment make the decision. And now, you can't do this for every decision. There's a bunch of decisions where, in emergencies especially, where the boss has to dictate and go. But in normal business, there's a lot of decisions that could be made based on real experiment instead of based on opinion and analysis. So you have to set up, let's call it an experiment team. How do you set up this team? I mean. An experiment can't be run by one person, right? Sure. Yeah, so experiments can be run by one person. So an experiment, what I mean by that is just um, it, not market research. It's typically involving a customer or a user who actually is doing the real thing for real with their real time. And they don't know they're in an experiment. So what you then read is behaviors, not their opinions, not what they say they will do. But what you're measuring is what they're actually doing. And then that becomes the basis for the decision. Okay. I require that each experiment start with a numeric hypothesis, like science. So the person running the experiment has to have a specific numeric hypothesis on what they expect the outcome to be. And then we judge the results based on comparing the actual results to the going in hypothesis. And who is making the decision when an experiment is going to happen and when yeah. it's not? Hopefully the person making a decision when to do an experiment and 
what to do it on is the person whose idea it is. So basically in your company, people who want to run an experiment, they are free to do so? Yes. They don't have to ask for permission? Specifically, no, if the experiment is really costly or very slow, then you'll want to get more people involved. But our goal is, whenever we can, to drive the cost of experiments down so they can be fast and cheap. Some experiments are done in a day, at no cost. And this means you really take this decision if an experiment is being run, you really take it away from the hierarchy and let the data or the results of the experiment well, say what you're going to do. Once you have results from a real experiment, who are you going to believe? An experiment with data or some guy with an opinion? So you naturally start focusing on the results of the experiment and they drive the decision once you have them. Now it's changed how my CEO and I lead. We used to ask, what's your recommendation and what's your analysis? Now we ask, what's your decision and what was the experiment you ran to make that decision? Or if you haven't run an experiment, how fast are you going to run the experiment? How has this changed the structure within your company? Has it changed? Had it had an effect? I think uh, the, the changes this, that this brings are several. The org chart is the same, mm -hmm. so no change to the official structure. But where the decisions get made has changed. I think uh, as I look at leadership in what we could call the innovation age, I see four changes that are happening, or four, let's call it roles, that leaders today have to do. One is champion a grand challenge. The leader has to pick up what's the challenge we are trying to achieve in this company or in this division or in this product. So the leader has to take the view of what the future should be that we're working towards. So that's the first role of the leader. The second is, the leader's got to put the systems and culture in to make decision by experiment happen, to make it cheap and fast to run experiments. And to enable small teams, even individuals, to be able to quickly run an experiment. So for example, at our company, at Intuit, one barrier that's always in the way of teams is the legal department and getting approvals by lawyers. So our legal team has put in a set of six guidelines, six different types of experiments with guidelines in each. And if somebody's experiment fits one of those six guidelines, they don't talk to legal. The legal says, don't see us, run your experiment. This is an example of removing the barriers and even removing the speed bumps that get in the way of teams who want to run experiments. So that's so the, the second piece. The process the, becomes faster. Yes, the leader has to put in the systems and the culture to run experiments rapidly. Third thing, the leader's got to savor surprises. Because one of the great things about experiments is you get surprised. Things don't work the way you think. And that's learning. That Every surprise, whether the results are better than you expected or worse, that's an opportunity for learning. And the leader has to model and work to savor the surprise. What do we now know that we didn't know before we ran this experiment? Because that's the learning that builds mastery and builds the understanding of where the world is today. That's the third. The fourth thing is the leader has to live by the same rules. Meaning the leader's ideas also have to be tested by experiment. Except in an emergency. Okay. But in normal business, so one of the companies who's practiced decision by experiment is Toyota on the assembly line. Uh, one of the professors that I traveled with to Japan to observe how Toyota manages their assembly line process told me of a time he'd been visiting a Toyota factory and there were two separate experiments to solve the same problem going okay. on simultaneously. One experiment was the idea of a team leader, somebody that has a like, eight people reporting to him. The other experiment being run in parallel was the idea of the plant manager. But the plant manager's idea had to be tested just as the team leader's idea was. 
Okay. So those are the four rules. Champion that grand challenge. Now make it easy for your people to try their best ideas out to achieve that grand challenge with experiments. And then savor the surprises that result. And then live by the same rules yourself. How do you document all this? Do you document all this to we, save somehow the learnings? Yes. Um, I would say in a perfect world, yes, experiments yeah. should be documented. And I think at Toyota, for example, they have a form that people use to document the experiments. But I find the world moving fast enough that we don't take the time to document. We use the experiment result to make the decision on that team and then move on to the next decision and thus the next experiment. Mm. I mean, you've been in the business for many years now. Uh, I think the, the environment in which our business embedded in has completely changed. It's much more dynamic, it's much more complex. Uh, what kind of influence do you think has this environment on leadership on leading a company? Yes, I think there was a day when the leaders gut feel and judgment could be educated over the years and would remain valid for a long time. An era of slower change. And maybe then it made more sense for the boss to make the decisions and tell everybody what to do. But I think in I think today that era has past, but too many bosses are still clinging to the view that they are the Caesar, the decision maker. Mm -hmm. And decision by experiment is very different. It's challenging for bosses. Bosses like to think they tell the folks what to do and they're the decision maker. Right. It's a challenge to build the new skills in leaders to make decisions by a better way. But I think that's the challenge for leaders in the years ahead. So how would you argue, for example, if, if you define these new forms of leadership, uh, what makes a CEO or the mani managing director, if you look at the payroll, at the mm -hmm. monthly check, mm -hmm. maybe a hundred times more valuable mm -hmm. than one of your guys bringing in an experiment and probably, you know, uh, yes. Defining a new kind of product or whatsoever, which brings a couple of million dollars over the years. So, uh, do you imagine this, that these new forms of leadership will have an impact, or will will actually end up in in asking this question? I think the question you're asking is what happens to the high pay and privilege of a CEO if you have a company where people throughout the organization are making the decisions based on experiment. I think a couple of things are true. I think the CEO is paid to get the absolute most brilliant thinking and ideas and progress from the people in the company. The decision by experiment so accelerates the speed, the ideas, and the innovation that a CEO who makes that happen is worth so much more. Also think about what this does to attract and keep the most talented, most innovative people. If you're a super high talent person, and today the war is for the super high talent people, yes. they're the ones who really drive the breakthroughs. And if you're one of those high talent people, which environment do you want to work in? One where the boss tells you what to do, and if you have an idea, you have to sell for weeks or months up a chain with a lot of people that don't get it. You want to work there? or in a company which says, your ideas are so important, we've made it easy for you to try out your ideas because we want those ideas to succeed. Which company are you, are the best people going to want to work for? Right, maybe, but these might also be the people, you know, who leave the company and build their own company by themselves, right? So, if you foster these ideas, how do you remain the, the core the core value of a company. What's key in this is to remember that the leader sets the ultimate direction, picks that grand challenge, that aspiration that the company has. That's an important decision that the leader does. And then the leader has to inspire people to go achieve that. 
But I'll tell you, the inspiration gets a lot easier when people get to try out their ideas, their best idea to achieve that goal. It's a much more inspiring place to work. I'm not arguing this. I'm just asking, you know, I mean, don't you foster also this way that the people, like, you know, when I, as you said earlier, your parents, you know, had a, or your father had a completely different understanding of leadership. Like, when I look at my parents these days when they were working, once Mercedes-Benz, always Mercedes-Benz. You know, these days the change is much, much faster and the, the core values of a company, uh, they have to be, I think, very, very clear, you know, that people who drive experiments or people who think in a more entrepreneurial way than a regular employee, they could leave the company, or for them it's much easier to leave the company. So what do you do as, as a company to keep this, this human resource, you know, closely linked to your, to your company? I think that observation is right. Today the best talent are very mobile. They're highly sought after. Other employers beckon to get them in. And now many of the best go start their own business. The only hope for, I believe, for an established, large, successful company to keep its best, most entrepreneurial talent is to allow that entrepreneurship to flourish inside the company, to, to run it so that people can be entrepreneurial instead of just being good soldiers. And that's what this decision by experiment does. The most important values of a company are those determined by their behaviors, not just by their words. And the behavior that you're creating with decision by experiment is the behavior that keeps your best people. You were telling earlier that you had the feeling that you might have to change the way you're leading your company. Where did this feeling come from? Was it, you know, where is revenue going down or did you see or did you somehow realize decisions were made in the wrong way or where did this feeling come from? feeling came from just observing things inside the company, observing our leaders, our decisions, some of our failed decisions, observing the ideas that folks who weren't leaders had. I just got a feeling there was a better way. And then some observations of some other companies and how in certain areas of other companies they had found a very different way of working uh, inside Google Search, for example, they run three to 5,000 experiments a year in Google Search. Real experiments with real users using it. In fact, if you use Google for a week, their chief scientist tells me you're likely to be a participant in three or four experiments. And they're measuring your behavior to make decisions about what works and what doesn't. So a very fast cycle experimentation approach there. I saw it in some healthcare, I saw it in auto manufacturing. And I said, wait a minute, this should work for us as well. So that was 2008 when I had this view. And we started okay. then talking about it inside the company. And it was actually here in India that it picked up on the early side. Later in 2009, I discovered a guy named Eric Rees who was giving speeches and starting to train companies in the same concept. I said, oh my God, that's the same idea. He just explains it better than we do, and he's taken the idea even farther. He has now written a book. The book is called The Lean Startup. I've not seen any concept get adopted as fast in Silicon Valley as the Lean Startup. I also have the view that while Eric wrote his book about startups, that I believe that large, successful companies need the lean startup even more than startups do. Why? In a startup, if you make a bad decision, you're out of business pretty quick. The market will correct you rapidly. But if you're a big, successful company, you can persist in bad decisions for a long time. You can spend months, years, yeah. big teams working in a bad direction, working on something that ultimately fails. Big companies need that discipline of rapid exposure um, so that ideas get tested early. 
yeah. and the wheat and the chaff can be separated. Do you have any kind of numbers uh, which show you that the cost of failure has been dramatically reduced within your own company ah. since you're running these experiments? Yes, we don't have the kind of scientific numbers, but I can tell you that we did have some big efforts, multi-year efforts with large teams. In our kind of business, a large team can be 70, 80, 90 people. Mm. Efforts that ultimately failed. And when you go back and look, you can see they never tested their leap of faith assumptions. They had certain beliefs that had to be true for this effort to succeed. And they, because the bosses believed in it, they never had to prove those beliefs. So meaning they followed more or less blindly even though they were... They followed intelligent thinking, good analysis, the judgment of bosses, off the cliff. You were saying also earlier that it's quite, you mentioned that it is a challenge for the leaders to accept that this decision is somehow going away from the person who is leading. But do the employees accept this new responsibility? Yeah, what I find about uh, the smart, innovative people in your company, they do. They want, they have ideas, they know what the goal is. They've got great ideas. They just want a chance to try their idea. Sometimes people ask me, well, do you have to incent or pay for innovation? I find the smart people, they're, they're brimming with a great idea they want to try. They don't need to be bribed to invent. They already have. Mm. They just want the chance to prove their idea, to test it out. And when a company then accelerates those ideas getting in into test, into real experiments, into customer's hands, that is a powerful force. Would you say that this kind of experimenting is, is going over all the different departments you have inside your company, or is it only related to, to products you have? Or would it be possible in the finance department as well as in the marketing department? This is a thoughtful question, because You can't run experiments on everything, but we're finding you can use experiments across the company. So the movement kind of started around new products, but we now use experiments to help us with our large existing products, to help us figure out how to change and improve those. We use experiments in the IT area, in HR, in marketing. Um, decision by experiment applies broadly, 